वेलकम टू स्टोरी बोर्ड आई एम शिवानी घरत एक और इज बुलिश ऑन इंडिया एंड द कंपनी प्लान्स टू ओपन मेनी मोर होटल्स इन द कंट्री इन द नेक्स्ट कपल ऑफ इयर्स से सबेस्टियन बर्जीन ग्रुप चेयरमैन एंड सीईओ ऑफ फ्रेंच मल्टीनेशनल हॉस्पिटैलिटी चेन एंड होटल चेन आई कॉट अप विद हिम एंड स्पोक टू हिम अबाउट मेनी थिंग्स इंक्लूडिंग व्हाई इज ही एक्साइटेड अबाउट द इंडियन मिडिल क्लास ट्रैवलर प्लान्स अराउंड पेरिस ओलंपिक्स देयर एफर्ट्स टुवर्ड्स सस्टेनेबिलिटी एंड मच मोर लिसन इन Sebastian we are meeting in Bengaluru in India tell us more about your visit and how do you look at the India market Well I'll tell you I'm it's, I'm a huge India fan for a lot of actually good reason and I and so those of you who know me well I hate to be a spectator of India I want to be an actor an actor in India so India for us is small it's 2% of our core worldwide so and it's way too small when you guys represent almost 20% of the world so you have the most populated country the fastest growth for the last 5 years likely the fastest growth for the next 5 years you have heritage you have education you have absolutely everything and of course geography so for me to miss india would be a stupid mistake <laughs> so since i want to be an actor the only way for aco to participate within india is for me to understand india so i came here and i've been in your country for 25 times now i i need to actually understand better the risk to be taken in india i need to understand better the owners the man I, i need to see government authorities i need to see my own people within india and and i just want to be a participant so yeah. this is the place not to miss since you said that you want to understand india better what are some of the conversations that you've had and you know what are some of the key takeaways from those conversations how has it changed your understanding uh, of uh, yeah, india I, I, and the people it's very it? simple as much as i love the opportunity of india which i really see and i can measure I need to understand better why does it take so long to build a hotel and to open a hotel. It takes within your country 4 to 6 years to get a hotel running. As compared to global? Global between 3 and 4 years max. Mm -hmm. Why do we have to wait 2 more years to get the hotel running? Sure. So we will will I have 100 hotel in India? I need way more than 1000 hotel in India, but I don't want that to be taken me 20 years. I'm too old to wait 20 years. <laughs> so, how could I go from one hotel to one southern hotel within the yeah. next 7 years? You're sure. going to be the third largest economy in 3 years. Sure. I want to be the largest player within 3 years. Sure, sure. And just this week you've made so many announcements uh, in APAC uh, with uh, over 80 new properties coming in uh, in the region. So, it can share where do you see the headroom for growth in APAC and also in the country. Well, we're going very fast. In APAC we have almost 250,000 rooms and only 11,000 rooms in India and you are the largest country of APAC so which is why the mismatch doesn't really play very well to me so we're going very fast in southeast asia very fast in korea very fast in australia very fast in malaysia indonesia and not fast enough in india so i need partners i mean i'm i'm not able to do anything without investors and owners so yeah. it's uh, whether it is the north the south the west or the east coast of india hmm. i'm actually this to india for me there's a domestic india which is difficult to grasp because i need partners but there's the other side of india which is almost as interesting for me is you're going to be more and more indians to go internationally mm -hmm. to go abroad It's which they abroad. are by the way well yeah but it's only 30 million it yeah. was 25 million last year hmm. the chinese and the us people go 150 million in each country outside of their own domestic market hmm. there's no doubt in my mind within 5 years that 30 million of last year will go to probably 80 to 100 million and you know what they're going to go five hours east they're going to go to malaysia southeast asia indonesia or they're going to go west they're going to go to africa or to the middle east or to egypt this mm -hmm. is exactly why aqua is the biggest density in terms of numbers of hotel so i want to be the recipient of indian travelers under the aqua live limitless loyalty card but in order for them to understand and know my brand i need to be visible and credible within india yeah. so there's two india for me Yeah sure and if you look at uh, you know the aqua properties in the country and some of the brands that you operate in of course there is uh, you know the luxury yeah. uh, you know space that you have then there is a premium one uh, you know with some of your uh, brands such as the grand mercure yeah. which i was staying in by the way <laughs> just That's good. here I hope you had a good experience uh, then there is um, of course there is a budget mid budget yeah. which is the likes of novotel yeah. and then absolute budget category of hotels which is ibis and ibis star is uh, which operate in the country where do you see the maximum headroom for growth in the country and why yeah there is actually two ways to look at it there is the affordable housing affordable accommodation which is as you said ibis novotel mercure hmm. that caters very well to the 
lower middle class, which is 30% of India today. And those people are super happy to go to secondary tertiary cities and get something they can afford when they want to visit families. Sure. And then there is the Pullman, Swiss Hotel, Fairmont, Raffles of the world. That is for the most privileged, blessed people or the higher emerging middle class. But your middle class people is going to go from 30% of today's population to 65% probably within 10 years or 20 years. So you need to be in each segment, but don't ever lie, don't ever overpromise, but make it a place when you can actually, you feel you're not being gypped. You feel you have value for money. Hmm. So I'm, I call us 46 brands. So I will cater for you depending where you want to go and how much you want to spend, which is what we do elsewhere. Yeah, well. but what, what will be your focus? Like where will the push B, which, Vol which volume, segment? Well, volume-wise, hmm. we'll be going deeper and a more speed on Ibis Novotel Mercure. This is where you have the Ibis greatest, Novotel largest Mercure. population demand and appetite. Sure. But in Udaipur, in Jaipur, in Bangalore, in Goa, we're going to make a big push on luxury positioning with Sofitel, hmm. with uh, Raffles, with Orient Express, and, and with uh, Fairmont. So it's, a, it's two different ways of approaching and two different teams of Accor. Yeah. Because I reshuffled the uh, organization on two different expertise, yeah, what scale are, and luxury. What are some of the challenges when it comes to creating luxury uh, positioning and premium positioning in a country like India, where, you know, if you visit any of the hotels, yeah. like any of the luxury properties, yeah. hospitality is something that you will be blown away by. So, uh, do you find it challenging at all uh, to create that luxury positioning in the India market? No, it's not more challenging than being in the Middle East or being in San Francisco or being in London. It's kind of the same challenge. Don't ever lie. Make sure people see the, mat the materials, the beauty. When they touch the doorknob, they need to understand that I guess it's not cheap. Same thing with the shower fixtures. So, it's a uh, no, it's not more difficult. They, you know, a lot of people have been telling me that luxury market in India, maybe it's going to be difficult. But you invented luxury. Oberoi invented luxury a long time ago. So did Stage. So, so did Lila. Yeah. So I'm only learning from what existed already and trying to enhance it, which is difficult, by the way. So you're learning from Oberoi Taj and uh, Lila Sebastian. Let's just zoom out and move out of India market and let's speak about, uh, you know, the global hospitality. Yeah business. Sustainability is a hot topic yes. for hotels and hospitality. Tell us more about your focus and your plans in that direction. Well, there's two focus uh, when it comes to sustainability and CSR. One is water scarcity, which for me is the biggest focus because you have a third of the global population that doesn't have access to drinkable water. Sure. And that alone is unbearable. And of course, when I'm opening a hotel, which we do almost every day, I'm taking the precious resource from local communities. They may not have water and I'm actually adding more water needs when opening a hotel. That is something that I need to pay attention. And the only way to overcome the, the resources you're taking from a local community is looking at what is it you are contributing to the local community. And that is the S of CSR. Mm -hmm. Accor is probably top three companies in the world hiring more than 100,000 people locally every single year. Mm -hmm. And 60% of those 100,000 people never went to university, never had a job before and they live three kilometers away of that newly opened hotel wow. in a small town. Wow. And that is a miracle of our court to be able to do it at ease with passion, energy, and actually welcoming it. And you're talking different colors of skin, different religions, different mm. privilege, different education within Chile, Nigeria, Laos, wherever it is. And we love doing it. And it works all the time. And they leave every three years. Yeah. And I don't blame them leaving because they just have better self-esteem, stronger person, and they go on their own and I'll yeah. do it again and again. Yeah. And so anything which is social impact, uh, I think pioneering that way is probably a marker on giving a chance to somebody in life. Yeah. So you you have to put the two together. What are you doing for the environment? Mm. How much carbon emission are you putting? How much food waste? How much water are you taking? But how much are you contributing to local craftsmanship and local employment? And that's a debate I'm, uh, I'm playing with every single day. Yeah, since you mentioned hiring and we are on the topic of hiring, uh, you know, I was speaking to one hotelier once and, you know, to depict a brand in front of the consumer who walks into your yeah. hotel, every single person has to embody the spirit of that brand, especially somebody who's working at the front desk mm. to every single staff that the customer is dealing with. So having said that, how has the skill set for somebody working in this industry evolved, given that this industry was also affected by, you know, a very uh, yeah, like we've impactful been on our knees. pandemic? We've been, we've been on our knees through the storms of COVID. And we've learned quite a lot about ourselves, by the way. I don't want to go back to it, 
But in many ways, it was kind of a blessed time for me to understand better what our core is and what should be stopping and doing. So, you know, we've, and we've been asking ourselves a question, being in 120 countries, 6,000 hotels, 320,000 people. I had a question last October, what's, what sticks us together? Whether you are at Sofitel or Fairmont or Ibis, by the way. Uh, and we came up with a sentence, which of course is a purpose. And the purpose is very simple, but super profound in terms of different wording. It says pioneering the art of responsible hospitality, connecting cultures with heartfelt care. If you have all those words together, pioneering, you moving, you daring, you basically taking a risk. And then art is because you happen to be a sculptor, a designer and expertise when you work in a hotel. Despite the segment, does not matter. A receptionist and an IBIS is as difficult a receptionist in a raffle. And then you go to connecting cultures. This is what I love the most about my job, is going from one continent to the other and then understanding the people of India are very different from the people of Chile. And then responsible hospitality is make sure you leave something behind that you're proud of. So don't, there's no second class, first class citizen, whether you are working in medium or premium. It's kind of actually the same kind of uh, values, which is human touch, human interaction, which is why I would never work for any telecom company because I need to meet and see somebody. And, uh, and I've been asking people of Accor, don't ask permission when you make a decision. When you're in front of a customer, speak with your heart. That alone will guide you on the best decision. Sure. Because that person wants to be heard and wants to be responded. And then just do it the way you've done it with wow, your kids. Wow, that's a great, great thought. That's really a great thought. Uh, but moving on, tell us about the disruptions that, you know, this industry has gone through. Of course, one we definitely briefly mentioned was COVID. Yeah. But apart from that, what are some of the disruptions, according to you? Well, we got two already. And I feel we could have died from both, by the way. And, uh, but we didn't. First was 20 years ago, the online travel agencies, the booking, Expedia, Trip.com of the yes. world. Those guys were fascinatingly good. They had big technology, greater access to data getting closer to Google on keywords and search. And so, and they were taking commissions away from us. Uh, and could we cope with them? We finally invested $400 million in technology. And now we have the same ability to basically get access to customers. But that was a danger. And of course, the independent non-branded hotels are still suffering quite a bit from that dependency on OTA. I respect them, by the way. I've never fought against them. Hmm. And then we have a second uh, big trauma, which was Airbnb. That guy was not taking commissions away from me, he was taking clients away from me. Yes. For something which was a wonderful experience, a third cheaper and a third larger in terms of space. And I can't compete. And then we've been able to adapt, understanding it's actually the same customer base. If you go four days with four people, you're likely to go to Airbnb. If you're going to be on your own or a couple for less than two days, you're probably going to be staying with me. Mm -hmm. So it's the same customers for different experience. Mm -hmm. And we coped. And now we have AI. Yeah. And, uh, and we haven't seen only the beginning of it. Uh, it's probably going to be an enormous transformation before and after the stay on basically CRM, customer relationship management. But it's probably going to be easing uh, the process of booking and returning and repeat customer base. So within the hotel, I don't want too much technology because I don't want you to go directly to your room without having to say hello to anybody. Uh, so. But I, I don't know whether it's going to be an enhancer or whether it's going to be traumatizing my industry. I believe positively. Uh, AI, for example, on pricing, uh, we are co revise our own pricing 2 million times per day. Whether you call at 10, 10 a.m. or 4 p.m., it's probably not going to be the same price because I will know my occupancy better by 4 p.m. So uh, that's a third revolution. I may have a fourth one, but I have no idea. The only thing I know is ACO is too big now to fail. Uh, we can cope with almost everything as long as I continue traveling and listen. Yeah, I, I, I'm surprised you said OTA and Airbnbs as uh, uh, like disruptors. Yes, they have been disruptors, but won't you look at them also as somebody who also expanded the market they to did. a great no extent? Question. Yes. No, no question. I've been telling everybody, we, my density in America is not big enough. Yeah. When somebody wants to come from Denver, he probably has no idea of a Novotel hotel in Paris or London. Thank God the OTA exists because they can book through Expedia and booking and they end up and at the Novotel. And top option. No, no, no question. Which yeah. is why I'm not fighting, but I was in a bit of despair because that was a high cost. When So I don't care what they come to an OTA, but I don't want them to pay twice to the same OTA. So yeah. when they come to Accor, they need to know Accor loyalty card and that way they can come directly. So French Accor, Paris Olympics is just around the yeah. corner. What are the big plans there? Yes, because we are a major sponsor and we can't fail and we're going to be in the eyes of the entire world and we just have to welcome the people and make sure they remember what they've seen in Paris. 
and uh, give them a chance to come back. So it's not only one time occasion, yeah. it's a time to shine and to present Paris as well as we could. Great. Thank you so much. Thanks for joining us today, Sebastian. It was wonderful me. speaking with you. Thank you. It is time for a short break. On the other side, we have Saurabh Lotia, Head of Marketing, PNB MetLife, speaking with us on their new campaign, their interest in sports and much more. Welcome back and now it's time for this week's notice board. PNB MetLife has just launched a new campaign featuring their ambassador cricketer Smriti Mandana that speaks about the role of trust while choosing a life insurance policy. To tell us more, we are joined in by Saurabh Lotia, Head of Marketing, PNB MetLife. Listen in. So Saurabh, first of all, welcome to Storyboard. Thank you, Shibani, for having me here. So, busy time for insurance uh, brands. Uh, over the past uh, couple of weeks, I have seen a lot of campaigns rolling out and you have also launched your new campaign. Uh, tell us more, uh, we uh, you know, share the insight behind the campaign and, uh, you know, towards the end of it also, you have your ambassador coming in. So, tell us more on how uh, this campaign was created. It's built around trust. So, share those insights with us. We looked at the research and uh, we looked at what consumers are saying and it came out very very clearly in fact 47 percent of respondents named trust as the number one factor basis mm. they will choose a life insurance company mm. now obviously uh, consumers are the king we completely looked at this insight and pivoted and made our campaign which focuses on trust and relaying communication on trust. Now, if we delve a little bit more deeper into what trust meant for consumers, uh, they came out with three things. One, what is the legacy or the heritage of the company? Hmm. Second, the ability of the organization to offer solutions which match their need and ease. Now, uh, we use these insights to design our campaign and communicate trust hmm. that is being portrayed by PNB MetLife as a life insurance provider. Yes. And then also the campaign features Smriti Mandana. Uh, you roped her in and got her on board around December 2023, a couple of months down the line, and uh, WPL just uh, concluded as well. So tell us about uh, you know your association uh, with Smriti. Uh, I think uh, it's uh, one of the best things that happened to PNB MetLife in this financial year. Hmm. If you look at the history of PNB MetLife, we've always been propagating fiscal fitness and physical fitness. And in this realm, our brand ambassadors have been in the line of sports. Hmm. We've been associated with promoting responsible sport, grassroots badminton since hmm. the beginning. But we wanted to expand the brand uh, visibility even further. And hence, the logical step up for us was the arena of cricket, which, which is religion for Indians. And when deciding on the brand ambassador, we, we looked at the ethos. Uh, PNB MetLife stands for giving confidence to every Indian to dream big and give them the confidence that we will be there with them to ensure their big dreams are fulfilled. If you look at Smriti Mandana and how she has evolved into a world uh, leading cricketer, she got selected for the Indian under 17, uh, Mumbai under 17 team at the age of 11. So she always he, says the starting point of her success was the dream, the big dream that she dreamt about making it large in the world of cricket mm -hmm. to do that the commitment the dedication and the reliability of her performance is what made her an outstanding player now this is exactly what echoes with what pnb metlife stands for what are also some of the key uh, you know insights from life insurance uh, that you can share with us that are shaping some of your strategies because having said everything uh, still the penetration of life insurance in the country is very very low. Shivani uh, you are absolutely right uh, the insurance penetration in India 
is is not at the most optimal stage in fact the regulator has a vision of insurance for all by 2047 how we are as a company trying to contribute towards that is work from number one work towards creating more awareness hmm. now the unique aspect you asked about life insurance now that's an aspect we need to create more awareness about hmm. now in this direction uh, the regulator has distributed states amongst various companies pnb metlife is the official lead insurer appointed by irdi in two states hmm. madhya pradesh and jammu and kashmir hmm. what we do over there is we are trying to work with the local government authorities hmm. and go to grassroots levels to create awareness about insurance it's hmm. not about product sales in the beginning it's about introducing why why insurance is beneficial for you so hmm. that people are aware and hmm. once they are aware is when they will start buying more uh, we go do grassroots activation uh, drives we hmm. go and do uh, local uh, plays to demonstrate the benefits of life insurance in a language which hmm. is understood by a common person hmm. uh, creating uh, awareness in the form of uh, putting up codings working with local channels whether it is uh, local cable television local newspapers where we are trying to reach tier 2 tier 3 or even the rural areas mm-hmm. where the need for insurance is high however mm-hmm. the current penetration is low yeah but when you are doing these grassroots level activations and you mentioned himachal pradesh and jammu and kashmir tell us uh, you know uh, some of the conversations that you are having with your consumers what are they saying like what is where is the reservation uh, you know uh, why are they not purchasing insurance why is it you know that the penetration is so low in the country uh, shivani there's just one reason it's about awareness hmm. as the the per capita income of indians rise the hmm. disposable income with them is rising hmm. and hence the aspect that will drive a higher penetration is about awareness hmm. till now they were the consumers were looking at uh, more avenues to sustain their life or even traditional method uh, ways of investing because they were aware about that hmm. the, now life insurance transcends beyond just term insurance it mm-hmm. comes out with products which are customized from a very small ticket size meant for micro insurance mm-hmm. to somebody who's into a small or medium enterprise or mm-hmm. even large or medium corporates who are looking at offering a coverage for their employees mm-hmm. so it's the combination of the demographics the income when combined and mixed with high awareness at grassroots level is when the penetration starts coming up sure sure thank you so much thanks for joining us today and thanks for sharing these insights with us thank you with that it's a wrap on story about this week you can catch all of our content on facebook x and youtube thanks for watching we will be back same time next week see you soon